and a very good evening to you and a warm welcome to the turning point for ITN Sri Lanka. And as I keep saying to you, um, the turning point has very many interesting guests and with expert views on all sorts of things that helps you, the people, uh, decide all sorts of things. And today is no different, although we go international. We go to our neighboring country, to Bangladesh, where our guest tonight is a director of the Bang Bangladesh Center for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the Jehangirnagar University in Bangladesh. He is uh, none other than Professor Shahab Khan. Good evening to you, Professor Khan, and welcome to The Turning Point. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much for joining us. I'd like to ask you, uh, obviously this is in light of all, all sorts of things that's happening in your country, but I'd like to ask you this. Uh, back in uh, the early 70s, uh, Henry Kissinger infamously or famously, depending on your point of view, described Bangladesh as an international basket case. Uh, by 2023, uh, people were hailing Bangladesh as a model nation. Um, but by September 2024, uh, Bangladesh is burning. How's the decline? How's the climb? Why did it go down? Thank you very much. This is a fascinating question. Yes, indeed, uh, Mr. Kissinger and Alexis Johnson really labeled Bangladesh as a basket case. Uh, but certainly over the next 50 years, Bangladesh has done tremendous tremendously well in terms of its economic indicators, uh, human security indicators, human development indicators for sure. Um, and we have seen unprecedented growth over the past two decades in Bangladesh. But the problem was not the economic indicator, rather whether the benefit of that entire economic structure growth was equally being distributed across the society, across the people. Uh, while there was a phenomenal growth in terms of infrastructure, in terms of um, GDP, yeah, but the problem essentially remained in governance, uh, the principles of economics, essentially, uh, whether all this wealth is creating welfare or disparity. Uh, we have seen over the past uh, five, six years, uh, while the development spree continued, we also saw that astronomical financial, illicit financial uh, fly, uh, flight of uh, money from Bangladesh. We have seen uh, uh, while there is a case of corruption, uh, the rights, uh, uh, democratic rights were essentially being crippled. Uh, and subsequently, we have also seen uh, that uh, the wealth was getting accumulated by a few rather than the most. So I think that disparity, uh, disfranchised uh, youth in terms of politics or democracy, and then obviously required uh, reforms in economy were not visible. Uh, that resulted in a catastrophic uh, failure uh, in the part of the government in delivering uh, economic benefits, entitlements to the mass. Uh, so the result was, uh, we have seen in the month of July, August, protest broke down. Uh, the state resorted uh, uh, in violence. It opened live fire against its own people. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the whole situation when you try to suppress uh, movement and uh, a political movement uh, that was essentially geared towards economic benefits or economic entitlement uh, becomes absolutely a repressive uh, situation. Uh, unfortunately, tragically, more than 500 people uh, died. They laid their lives uh, for the cause of economy. Uh, and that resulted in the ousting of the immediate past government and installed an interim government that has come with the phenomenal promises uh, accepted by the international community, uh, embraced by the mass people uh, with the hope that this will bring uh, what we call economic justice, uh, social justice, and most importantly, the return to democratic institutions in the coming years. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Shab. For, for Bangladesh, what has been the impact of the recent crisis? Uh, what has been uh, the impact on uh, students and young people? 
the future, think, uh, really, of Bangladesh. I think the most important thing that we have seen, this is pretty much in line with what we have seen in Sri Lanka, in that uh, uh, the unemployment was a massive problem. Uh, and the unemployment issue was largely been ignored because we now have a demography which is phenomenal. Gen Z is now uh, the key factor behind uh, the employment, productivity, and the progress of the society. So I think uh, that was largely being ignored by the, uh, by the then government. Uh, and certainly that made uh, the youth feel marginalized and, of course, alienated from the overall economic structure. So I think uh, the impact uh, was quite devastating uh, because uh, the fear of uh, in or insecurity in terms of livelihoods or the future was very much there. And then that was coupled with uh, uh, inflation. Inflation remained largely unchecked, uh, which has put a massive pressure on uh, livelihoods and families. And then if you don't have jobs, certainly that creates a massive anxiety, not only within the youth, but also within the families. So the accumulation of all these issues uh, became quite vivid, uh, as we have seen in the case of our students. Um, essentially, this entire movement was heavily apolitical. Uh, and when you have this apolitical uh, movement, you also get to see that people were demanding for massive reform uh, in the economic institutions, public service institutions, uh, social institutions, and of course, without any doubt, the political institutions. Uh, so I th sorry, I thank, think you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. I just want to uh, say to you, uh, I just want to ask you, in, in Sri Lanka uh, two years ago, um, what happened, we had protests too, but um, in Sri Lanka, the, the um, law and order uh, was restored pretty quickly. Um, in fact, there was no real uh, breakdown as such. Um, and the, uh, the return of fully implementing the rule of law um, took place pretty swiftly. It appears that that broke down in, in Bangladesh. Um, how does, how does one recover from a situation like that in Bangladesh? How, how would, you, how would the, the new government in Bangladesh, how would they come out of that? I think uh, uh, the similarities between Sri Lanka and Bangladesh is pretty much the same. Uh, I mean, similarities are uh, within the economic structure. And then, of course, we got to see uh, that youth was demanding much more of a freedom in terms of their future uh, job opportunity, economic entitlements, and so on, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and Bangladesh is pretty much the same. So what happened is at least uh, the Sri Lankans have returned to uh, normal lives because uh, the post-crisis uh, uh, Sri Lanka, I mean, economic crisis Sri Lanka or the uh, uprise, the economic uh, uh, reform was phenomenal. And we are now seeing that Sri Lankan model of economic growth has essentially helped in reducing tensions between the government and the individuals or the society and the state. Now, when we have the similar situation, but we have an interim government, uh, which has uh, uh, undertaken a massive reform initiatives, what we have seen in the case of Sri Lanka too, uh, and Bangladesh's uh, massive uh, reform initiatives are linked with uh, economic institutions largely, and then law and order situation. Uh, judiciary is another important factor. While these reforms are quite painful, definitely, I mean, uh, for any country, reform is always painful. Uh, but what we have seen uh, that people are now showing their, uh, their uh, uh, what I would say, uh, hope and confidence on the interim government because at least they have come up with the solutions uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the grievances that uh, the youth and the families and the uh, individuals had or the citizens had, and as well as the international community. And I think what we have learned from the Sri Lankan case, as we have seen in the, uh, in the recent past, uh, uh, 
as the reform continues. Uh, they have really focused on uh, services, uh, particularly to address the skills gaps. Uh, and then the skills gaps are essentially geared towards uh, economic transformation, uh, which is phenomenal in the case of Sri Lanka right now. So something uh, similar, uh, the current government in Bangladesh is undertaking that we really need to create institutions that will build skills of the youth who are the driving factor behind uh, the political future of a country, or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka in that case. Um, and that is essential for uh, empowering the people too. So what we are now seeing in the case of Bangladesh to create a normal life or return to normalcy, uh, the government uh, has taken massive uh, reform, which resonates the demands of the public, which we get to see in the case of Sri Lanka too. Now, uh, Pro Professor Shab, uh, thank you again. But um, how does one, with, if, we, if we compare what happened in Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka had uh, a team of um, experienced politicians who took over and, and, and did what they had to do. Um, and um, in this sort of period of time, I, I, I don't want to delve too much into politics over here because we have election around the corner. But if, how does one, without much governance experience, uh, certainly a lot of experience in, in other matters, um, uh, in, you know, microfinance and so on. But how does somebody without governance experience um, rule or come back to manage an economy uh, and the rule of law and so on and so forth with a largely inexperienced team? Oh, I mean... I mean, I think uh, uh, it would be uh, it would be justified if we say that uh, a non-partisan approach to economy is as good as political approach to economy. The very simple reason is uh, we have inherited an economy that was not running on the basic principles of economic. Uh, justice. So therefore, I think uh, it is less to do about inexperiences, but more to do about uh, the understanding of the problem and build a policy uh, along with the right people, uh, which will uh, be which will be pragmatic, which will be practical and doable instead of coming up with a populist agenda all the time. We have seen that the rise of uh, uh, populist uh, economic issues are uh, not essentially uh, a good thing to keep the state stable. And we have now seen, we have seen that in many parts of the world. So I think uh, uh, what I would draw from the Dr. Yunus's cabinet or interim uh, cabinet uh, is the pool of people who understands and diagnose the problem and delivered the reform. So that's exactly what is happening. That has exactly what has happened in Sri Lanka. That's why we have seen that the Sri Lankan economy is uh, is getting back to normalcy at a very, very astronomically fast speed. Uh, um, so, uh, Sorry, uh, uh, Professor Shahab Khan. Um, it's now time uh, to take a break and listen to these other messages. The turning point for IT in Sri Lanka will return after a moment with Professor Shahab Khan from Bangladesh. And welcome back to the Turning Point for IT and Sri Lanka. I'm in conversation this evening with Professor Shahab Khan from Bangladesh. Fulbright scholar, uh, Shaveling Scholar and, uh, and many uh, accolades um, for you, uh, Professor Shahab Khan. Um, but I want to ask you this question. Uh, Sri Lanka, during its own problems, managed to uphold its constitution and uphold the rule of law. And so we followed various procedures um, and we upheld democracy. In Bangladesh, uh, what is the, the, the fact is that this government has been um, changed through uh, 
not through constitutional uh, procedures and, and rule of law and so on. So what chances for a return to the proper, um, proper democracy, if you like, especially when think, unconstitutional things have happened? I think, uh, I think uh, a very uh, important question, uh, because we inherited a political culture or political leading to political institutions uh, in which winner takes all uh, uh, approach. So, which was very uh, devastating. And we have seen over the past 15 years, uh, virtually uh, the country became a uh, victim of no politics or malpolitics. Um, as a result, there were structured way to alienate uh, the major political parties from the mainstream political systems. Uh, we had a very flawed elections over the past, uh, past, few, uh, past three elections in Bangladesh. Now, that has caused a massive unrest, not only uh, linking the economy, but by saying that the country has de facto become one party uh, government. And when you have a one party government and one party parliament, there is a lack of uh, a check and balance, accountability and transparency. And I think that made the whole corruption uh, kleptocracy quite embedded in the country. Now, people, uh, when they became highly critical of economic uh, entitlements or the distribution of economic justice, they also figured out that political institutions are no longer functional. So essentially, when you have a very concentrated uh, political power, people uh, don't want to see the reputation of that political concentration in Bangladesh. As a result, uh, the mass movement, which was apolitical, eventually got the political sense by saying, yes, we do uh, understand that economic justice is not there, but the current regime, if it continues, then there is no chance for uh, electoral system to return, through which we can raise our voice. Uh, so uh, the mass protest and the movement uh, boiled down to one demand that the government has to go. So the government was ousted uh, on uh, August 5th, and then uh, by the declaration of the president, uh, uh, and with the help of uh, the armed forces, the new interim government came into existence. Uh, and I think the new government has come with a public mandate similar to uh, that would have happened in the case of uh, parliament if it was functional, uh, which should have been uh, inclusive and participatory, free and fair. So I think uh, the mandate that the people gave to interim government by ousting uh, the previous government uh, becomes uh, a moral uh, ground for the current government to function. And there is no constitutional uh, loopholes as yet uh, in validating the acts of the interim government. But most certainly interim government's end uh, uh, result would be, I mean, its end delivery should be uh, to return to parliamentary democracy. And I think once the economic reforms are done, once the uh, essential reforms in terms of human resources, in terms of uh, uh, electoral uh, institutions are well accepted by all the political parties and the public in general. Uh, they will be declaring a pathway or roadmap for uh, new elections through which uh, we expect to elect a new government. So, so far, uh, the situation over here uh, is that uh, the current uh, regime has the public mandate, which we believe is similar to democratic mandate. Uh, since we didn't have any uh, good elections over the past years. Uh, and in future, the mandate of the government will be, the interim government will be, to allow it create an enabling environment for the electoral uh, uh, political parties to come into power. Given, given, the, um, <clears throat> given the intensity of the battle, if you like, uh, that went on in Bangladesh uh, and the horrendous murders and so on, um, the burning of businesses um, as well. How does Bangladesh 
intend or what will Bangladesh do to retain or regain its international credibility? I think the first, first uh, thing that uh, the Dr. Yunis government has done is the uh, reform age uh, has formulated a reform agenda, uh, which actually reflects uh, multiple views uh, in the democracy, uh, democ strengthening democratic institutions, which I think the West was very much interested in. Uh, there is a financial accountability mechanisms which uh, the interim government wants to do uh, in collaboration with the international community. It has reformed the investment agencies and authorities substantially, uh, which is now which are now being headed by excellent pool of human resources uh, who have international credibility, outreach, and so on. And then, obviously, uh, the government has taken. Uh, undertaken a massive uh, restructuring of economic uh, uh, economic policies, uh, including including the financial regimes. Uh, the banking sector is going through a massive reform too. So, which means the government is working while working on reform. It is equally uh, equally uh, giving importance to uh, stability factor because. One thing that has become very clear that if we return to economic instability or social instability or perhaps political instability, then uh, Bangladesh will be again uh, uh, again fall into the trap of what we call um, a vicious circle of uh, uh, political uh, malgovernance. So we cannot afford to do that. Similar that the Sri Lankans uh, should uh, should always uh, carry forward the reform agenda. And if there is, once again, an instability, then not only the domestic polity will become upset, the international community will become upset. So I think uh, the uh, UNIS the government has rightly uh, addressed the international concerns uh, uh, for uh, us to have the best of governance procedures institutions, and most importantly, uh, to deliver uh, the right uh, balanced international uh, relationship. Uh, Bangladesh has a very strong relationship with La the West. Thank it you. has a very good relationship with China, too. Thank you, uh, Professor Shahab Khan. Um, as we come towards the end, I, I have a question. Uh, I have a statement. I have a question. Uh, but let's, uh, let's put it that way. Historically, Sri Lanka has been a non-aligned uh, nation. Um, Sri Lanka's culture uh, always displays uh, magnanimity and gratitude and the people of Sri Lanka, uh, the government of Sri Lanka are undoubtedly uh, deeply grateful for the assistance that Bangladesh provided us uh, just over two years ago uh, when we had a little under 20 million dollars in the kitty. Um, and uh, so Sri Lanka has viewed uh, Bangladesh, uh, what the going ons in Bangladesh with, uh, with grave concern, uh, with a great uh, feeling for the people of Blang Blang Bangladesh. And um, the people are truly sorry about what's going on there. Um, so in a way, um, do you think that Bangladesh would like to borrow uh, our people to, uh, to show them a few ropes on how to get it all going again? Do you think you might want to do that? Oh, I mean, I mean, definitely. I mean, as I mentioned, uh, that Sri Lanka has become a very interesting uh, example, not only for Bangladesh, across the world. I mean, look at the way uh, uh, the current regime has uh, made a substantial contribution to the uh, to the Sri Lankan life to go back to normalcy is phenomenal. And if you look at uh, how they're dealing with inflation, uh, security, disruptions to public services is also extraordinary. I mean, within the very short period of time. Uh, and I think these are the examples that uh, needs to be publicized. That's, uh, and, and, and I think um, the Sri, Lankan, uh, Sri Lankans are very active in Bangladesh. We have a considerable Sri Lankan diaspora over here. And I think uh, uh, all of them are now uh, seeing the practicalities of life. So I think uh, when you mentioned that whether Sri Lankan presidency or 
Sri Lankan polity can always be standing up for Bangladesh. That will be the most encouraging thing Bangladesh can get. So I think uh, I would strongly recommend that uh, uh, Sri Lankans uh, should stay within the course of their economic reform and growth um, that we are now seeing. And, and certainly they can always uh, encourage Bangladesh and uh, speak to Bangladeshi politicians, speak to Bangladeshi uh, policymakers, the interim government, and, and uh, offer us uh, the supports that uh, would be the best for our people too. So it's a it's a mutual interest that I see, uh, which is phenomenal and can be translated into an absolutely outstanding example of cooperation, not Thank only you. bilateral, but the regional too. Thank you very much, Professor Shahab Khan from Bangladesh. Thank you very much. And that was all we had time for on the turning point for IT in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Take care Thank and you. bless you all.